Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the second day of the Offshore Alert Conference. And thank you to David, as always, for organizing such an excellent event. Um, we're going to talk about a small island economy that has been devastated partly by its own actions and partly by actions of outsiders who we believe were thoroughly well-intentioned but perhaps failed miserably. Uh, those of you who uh, are interested in fixing soccer matches and cricket matches are in the wrong place, as David said. I did talk to a good friend and colleague just before we came in and said, uh, I assume you're going to the sports fixing session because talking about collapsing small offshore financial centers is boring. And he said, no, 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 I'm coming to yours because I know how to fix a sports match. So <laughs> that perhaps <laughs> is encouraging. Uh, today, we are very, very lucky and fortunate to have uh, an extremely solid and experienced panel of speakers, all of whom I know personally and professionally very well, two of whom have sat on the board of the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority with me a number of years ago um, before we moved on to greater and better things. And we're going to look at an example of what can happen to a small offshore financial center when it gets buffeted by the winds of a financial crisis, partly from the outside and partly from the inside. And I think for many of you in the audience who live and work in small island offshore financial centers, many of these issues will resonate uh, and may cause you alarm or may cause you to sleep more happily at night after we've gone through the analysis. The f f three speakers we have in addition to myself are starting from the right, the piratical looking gentleman, which many of, who many of you may know is Dr. Richard Rahn. He is an economist based in Washington, D.C. Next to him is Dr. Warren Coates. Notice the doctors in front of all these names. These are not doctors of medicine. They're usually uh, PhDs in economics. Is Dr. Warren Coates, who is formerly with the IMF and is now a private consultant and has many years of experience in setting up and solving uh, banking system crises and he's spent a fair amount of the last few years uh, being helicoptered into places like Iraq and Afghanistan and parts of East Africa so delightful places that need banking systems he, he's not willing to tell you about the cash being dropped in Afghanistan however at the moment next to Warren is uh, Gonzalo Halles who is a dyed-in-the-wool private sector banker with years of experience um, I will leave it to him to mention and advertise the names of the banks he's worked for over the past 25 years. He is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Cayman Finance, which is the private sector lobbying group that exists to uh, present the position of the private sector in Cayman and internationally. So that's enough of the introductions. I'm going to invite the speakers to come in order as you see them there. So I'm going to start with Dr. Richard Rahn to tell us a little bit about what was wrong in Cyprus. Richard? Well, since Tim didn't do it, um, you need a proper introduction for me. I used to be the Vice President Chief Economist of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but I've actually run real businesses and been an entrepreneur, and now I'm a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, next time, Tim, can you get this down right? <clears throat> now, the next speaker after me is Warren Coates, my old friend and colleague. And Warren has a good number of slides, and he had sent us over his slides beforehand, and it was obvious that he would exceed his time limit. And so we had a little debate back and forth about this. So actually, I agreed to give him some of my time, so I will be much shorter than the others. I gave him time in exchange for him paying for dinner last night. And I'm a market-oriented economist. Also, I used to be a professor. And we were taught early on that the average college student has a span of concentration of about 20 minutes. This declines as you get older. Looking at this audience, I've determined the span of concentration is likely to be about seven minutes. So that's all I will go. And the stuff that Warren does afterwards will largely be irrelevant because none of you will recall it. 
<laughs> um, let me first start off a little bit about uh, the problem with Cyprus. It's bloated government. Uh, I'm sure you've never seen this any other place like the U.S., the U.K., the E.U., most of the world. But uh, my task was really very simple. It was, how did Cyprus get in trouble? Well, the banking sector in Cyprus is about eight times the size of their GDP. They had two major banks that had been buying bad debt. Now, think about it for a moment. <clears throat> uh, looking out there, it's large, well, there's a good number of women out there. It's hard to see with the lights shining in my one eye. But um, there have been studies that have shown that for a middle-aged male, that having one drink, glass of wine a day, is beneficial to your health. Um, it's good for your heart has other helpful functions. Having three or more glasses, however, is detrimental to your health. And governments around the world have basically become alcoholics. And still, so have many financial institutions or other regulated, highly regulated institutions tend to get into this alcoholic phase. This happened to these two big banks in Cyprus, the Bank of Cy Cyprus and Lockheed Bank. Um, they uh, bought a lot of or made lo loans to a lot of sort of dodgy things. There was a property bubble going on in Cyprus. Um, they had a number of non-performing loans. So they needed higher rate of return uh, investments to try to make up for this and a higher rate of return investment were Greek bonds. Now you think, why in the world would anybody buy Greek bonds? <clears throat> well, let's assume you're running one of these banks and you're in some delusion because you've gotten yourself in a bit of a mess. You have all these deposits and unlike uh, the U.S., um, there's not a real solid deposit insurance behind all this because you know the government is too small to really bail all your depositors, so you better bring in sufficient returns to be able to pay their money back. And one way of doing this is buying sovereign government debt because uh, the great international bank regulators in Baal, Switzerland, have said, oh, government debt, sovereigns don't default even though we've got a couple hundred years of sovereigns defaulting, but the official line is sovereigns don't default, and so usually you don't need reserves against sovereign debt, so you go off and buy all this stuff. Now, you rationalize it by saying, well, the EU would never let uh, sovereign debt um, default. And as long as you believe this, then, uh, and if you place your bet on that firm belief, that the Greek debt will not be defaulted, or what happened, the haircut, you know, actually it was a default because the uh, bondholders don't get paid all the way back. <clears throat> so you end up with a balance sheet that's underwater in the same way that any business would who makes bad investments or homeowners, or individuals, or whatever. So there's no particular secret what happened here. Um, they ended up upside down. and. Um, at some point, then the question became, who bails them out? And my other two colleagues are going to go ahead and get into that in great detail. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time just on the idea of what happens when governments get too big. It's sort of like an alcoholic. We know there is an optimum size of government um, that if governments get too large in relationship to their GDP, economic growth eventually falters and you go into collapse. The most extreme examples were, of course, the Eastern Europe and the old Soviet Union, the socialist governments. They always end up failing. We've had a couple cases around the world uh, where governments have pulled back to the brink before they went over. Perhaps the most notable case is Sweden. <clears throat> 
In the mid-90s, Sweden was going the way of Greece. The Swedes had tried to go the third way, had built the big welfare state, but they were running deeper and deeper in debt. GDP had not been growing. Their international rankings went from the fourth richest country in the world down to the 17th, and it was clear to the Swedes that they were on a course towards disaster. But the Swedes, unlike the Greeks, got together, of the political parties, and said, hey, we've got to change our ways, and they started reducing tax rates, reducing the size of the government. They went to a voucher system for the schools. They went to the Chilean type, a public pension system. And they actually did a turnaround, and Sweden has been doing quite well. It's still in the process of downsizing. It has a lot more to do. But the Swedish economy uh, has held up very well during uh, the period since the beginning of the financial crisis. Switzerland always did keep their government under control and has a smaller government percentage of GDP. It's about 33%. Um, the U.S. is now over 40. Um, Canada did a turnaround in the mid-1990s also. It was getting further and further behind the U.S., <clears throat> piling up unsustainable levels of debt. So the Canadian political parties from both the right and the left came together. They reversed course and Canada has been doing relatively well to the U.S., and their currency has climbed from about 60 cents on the dollar to roughly par with the dollar. So it shows democratic countries can turn around. It's not all hopeless. But um, the folks in Cyprus, like the folks in Greece, waited too long. And you can just see this never escalating uh, uh, growth in government spending. These slides are, are from my colleague Dan Mitchell of the Cato Institute. Um, if you want to know more about all this, you can go on just cato.org and you'll find uh, something like a thousand articles from me on these particular issues. But the key thing to remember here is if you're putting money in a bank, um, what is the bank doing with that money? And is there something really behind it? In the U.S., of course, we can do the bailouts because we print our own currency, uh, which is different than the Greeks or the Cypriots, who are not printing their own currency. Of course, the currency won't be worth much, but in nominal terms, you get the money back. And with that, I've probably exceeded my seven minutes, and I don't want a Warren to be shortchanged from the 250 slides he's going to show you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim and David, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I now understand why Richard left dinner early last night. Thank you, Richard, for giving me some of your time, selling me some of your time. Uh, I intend to take up where Richard left off, uh, exploring several alternative, two major alternative approaches to failed bank resolution and discuss what ultimately happened in Cyprus and why I think it's a very good development. Uh, as one quick bit of background through, throughout Europe, Spain in particular, say, uh, as uh, uh, banking problems emerged, in the case both of Cyprus and Spain, in, in part because of housing bubbles that, that popped, leaving banks uh, underwater or close to underwater, the governments who traditionally in Europe stood behind bank losses, absorbed bank losses, i.e. bailed them out, as, as we say, uh, themselves had reached perilous debt levels and could not safely borrow the additional money that they would need to bail out their banks. This is what lay behind looking wider in Europe for who else would bail out the banks. Well, at the end of the day, Cyprus took a very different direction, and I, w I want to explore that. Uh, let's see, I point this there. Uh, and let me 
First, very, very quickly, uh, I don't think I will even need Richard's extra time, but I'm happy that it's there if I do. But let, let me run very quickly through the key elements uh, that stand behind and constitute a sound banking system. F first is strict and good entry standards, fit and proper owners, adequate capital. I'm going to go through these rather quickly. Uh, high accounting and disclosure standards. Part, part of the problems in Europe are that they are not honestly disclosing the losses that are on their books. This, this distorts their business decisions. Uh, it distorts everything about how they operate. So th there needs to be a clear and honest picture of the condition of the balance sheet so that proper decisions can be made if there are problems. Uh, ap appropriate prudential standards. Effective supervision to monitor compliance with those standards. Prompt corrective action. And I will, uh, I will come back to this with regard to bank resolution because it's very important for how the U.S. system has operated. And clear and effective exit policies. That's, that's what's going to be the focus of my discussion, the exit policy. It's very, as in any industry in a capitalist economy, we, we sort of start by talking about free entry and exit. You know, the exit process is a very critical part of a healthy economy. Those that don't succeed, don't do well, et cetera, need, need to leave the business, free up the resources that they're, that they're wasting. This is true in banking also, but it's far more difficult to implement in banking. Uh, in much of the world, most of the world, the legal provisions for bank exit, which are based on a judicial corporate bankruptcy model, are virtually impossible to effectively implement for banks, leading uh, bank regulators to postpone recognizing insolvent banks or ultimately bailing them out uh, if it's no longer possible to ignore their insolvency. And this has given rise to the kind of moral hazard Richard was describing, that bank depositors and banks themselves behave in light of the presumption that if they make serious mistakes, they'll be bailed out. So this is, this is the, these are the, the key features of a typical judicial resolution of a failed institution or in the case of, of, of a bank, a failed bank. This is normal corporate bankruptcy procedures. It's what Cayman, for example, and probably most small jurisdictions have. Uh, the law provides either to revoke the license or to restructure. If you revoke the license, you, you can just picture how this would work or not work for a bank. All the deposits there are frozen, maybe for months and months, as assets are liquidated and whatever is collected is then paid out to the depositors. That's what happens when you revoke a license and liquidate. The option is to reorganize, and this requires the consent of the shareholders and the, and the creditors. And we've seen some examples of that working and many examples of that not working. So uh, the actual practice in regimes that have a judicial resolution regime, uh, legal infrastructure is that as banks get into trouble, the regulators forbear. Uh, they pretend that they're not insolvent. They allow banks to delay provisioning properly and acknowledging losses that are actually on, on their books. When the inevitable can no longer be denied, the state steps in, bails out the banks, uh, putting in taxpayer money to keep, keep them going. And there are very, I, I, ooh, sorry. The, uh, I've just put down examples of some of the countries I've, I've worked in that's not meant to be a comprehensive or systematic listing of, of examples. 
So the features of an efficient exit policy, bank ex pol uh, exit policy, uh, w which we would call an administrative procedure rather than a judicial procedure, is first of all to, th these are the basic principles you'd like to achieve, are first of all to intervene promptly. When banks incur losses, if they're not just one off but uh, an indication of more systematic problems, delaying the recognition of those losses invariably leads to more losses. The losses just keep getting deeper and, and more serious. So intervening early, being honest about the condition of the bank and intervening early when, when its capital becomes, as the U.S. says, critically, as they become critically undercapitalized. In a bank resolution, a bank that is failing to maintain adequate capital, the first principle, and, and this would be true of, of any approach to resolution, is that the, the shareholders uh, are the first line of defense. If the bank has incurred losses, they must fall first on the shareholders. But in a, uh, an efficient e exit policy, one that does not have the moral hazard of the bank bailout that we see commonly in, in Europe, the, the bondholders and other creditors, which would be then uninsured depositors, must be in line to absorb losses if losses are that deep. That's where prompt intervention is important because the sooner the authorities intervene, the smaller the losses will be and the less likely it is to reach down to depositors. But in principle, after, after shareholders, bondholders, and uninsured, uninsured depositors need, need to be at risk. And the resolution of the bank needs to be conducted, and this is really the difficult part of an administrative resolution process, uh, needs to be undertaken in such a way that whatever deposits remain after losses are acknowledged and absorbed uh, must be available without interruption. And the procedure should minimize losses, that is ma maximize recovery. Th this requires speed. Uh, the, the U.S. has been extremely successful with this kind of an administrative resolution approach. For 20 or more years, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the United States has had the legal authority for this approach to resolving banks, and almost nobody has ever heard of uninsured depositors losing money. This is very largely because the approach enables and encourages the FDIC to step in to intervene early before the losses become too large. And as a result, uh, the, the losses are often limited to shareholders, occasionally to some of the senior bondholders. And very, very rarely do depositors absorb any of the loss, a so-called haircut. So th this, this approach has worked extremely successfully in the United States. Uh, speed is obtained by careful preparation, advanced preparation by the FDRC. They move in on a Friday, close the bank, sell it over the weekend, all of it or the good parts of it, and Monday morning it opens under, under a new name and the depositors uh, barely no, notice the difference. This has worked extremely well in the United States, but uh, it is far easier to implement for small and medium-sized banks than it would be, say, for Chase or Citibank. And this is where the too-big-to-fail discussion comes from, that what do you do with banks that are just too big to resolve over a weekend? And uh, 
Cyprus has provided us with, with an example. Uh, as I said, for small, medium-sized banks, the FDIC has very successfully uh, resolved them o over a weekend with virtually uh, no inconvenience to any of the depositors in, in American banks, and they have closed hundreds and hundreds, thousands of, of banks. The open bank resolution, which would apply to too big to fail, is a more complicated undertaking uh, rather than actually shutting down the bank and selling off parts or, you know, selling off the surviving bank, the, the bank itself, you know, the resolution cannot be executed over a weekend and therefore the bank must be allowed to continue operating for a longer period while its losses are recognized, dealt with, uh, and uh, new owners found. The FDIC uh, in the last couple of years uh, executed such an open bank resolution by becoming the owner and continuing to operate a, a larger financial institution in, in the U.S. that had become insolvent. So it's more difficult, but it's, but it's doable. The, the ideal, and I, I'm stressing here why this approach to resolution is challenging, the, the ideal is to determine and acknowledge what the losses are and to absorb those losses through whatever creditor claim, uh, resources or claims there are, starting, as I said before, with the owners. They, they lose all of their capital. Actually, the capital is lost. They lose their claim to it. Uh, bondholders and ultimately, if necessary, un uninsured depositors. As soon as that determination is made, then as a practical matter, the remaining depositors need to be reassured that this, this recapitalized bank, it's been recapitalized by creditors losing some of their claims, uh, is now sound. It's safe. It's okay to leave their money there. This is the tricky part. Uh, and what can be done at this point is after the assessment is made of what the losses are and how much you have to write off creditor claims to guarantee the rest for a limited period of time, one or two years, while confidence is rebuilt that yes, indeed, you know, this bank is now properly capitalized, properly run, and so on. So that introduces a, a, a limited period of government guarantee as opposed to what has been the norm in Europe up till now of government guarantee of all creditors except shareholders uh, all the time. The idea of deposit insurance was a bit of a joke because all deposits were insured by the willingness of European governments uh, and where the individual government had debt problems itself, the EU stepping in and ba bailing out the bank. So this rolls back the frontier quite dramatically, imposing known losses or um, assessed losses and guaranteeing the rest. Now, why, I, I mean, uh, you're all in the f financial business, so you will understand uh, why what I just described is challenging to implement in practice. It's challenging to implement in practice because nobody knows exactly what the losses of a bank either, well, potentially are. Uh, if the bank is operated properly, it should have a honest assessment of the risk of various loans failing. It's required to provision to set aside some capital to cover uh, 
probabilistically expected losses. In, in the case of Cyprus, uh, as Richard explained, a, a significant chunk of losses of the two main banks in Cyprus were crystal clear and very well known. It was the 75% haircut on Greek sovereign debt and uh, a, a lot of non-performing loans in, in Greece. Those were pretty clear. But what about the other loans on, on the balance sheet? Some of which might still be performing. Some might be a bit late or dodgy or doubtful. How do you assess the potential loss from those assets on your balance sheet? That's challenging, and uh, this is why, uh, well, well, I'll take it up in more detail when we get to Cyprus itself. But that determination needs to be made. The best estimate possible by the supervisors must be made of w what is the expected value of the assets on the books of this bank to the extent that they fall short of the liabilities, to the extent they fall short of claims on the bank beyond the capital which is already gone, then those other claims, bondholders, uninsured depositors, uh, must receive haircuts sufficiently to absorb those losses. When those haircuts are administered, if the assessment of the loss was accurate or correct, the bank is then solvent again. But rather than the taxpayer having bailed it out, it is the creditors who bailed it out, and that's referred to as bailing in. And this is what happened in Cyprus. They were bailed in. So um, let me turn to Cyprus itself. And if I have an extra five minutes of Richard's time, then I'll be. No, no, I've just reached the end of my 15 minutes. <laughs> I, I have a Swiss watch. Okay, all right. Um, with, with this background, we can, we can look at what eventually happened in Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is a horror story of misstarts, etc., and Richard explained a lot of, of the background. But in, at the end of a false start, the final resolution was that the uh, recapitalizing the absorption of losses, which is the process of recapitalizing, these Cyprus banks would not come from the government of Cyprus, which is bankrupt itself, and it would not come from outside Cyprus. Those losses would be absorbed by the, by the creditors of these banks. And this is, this is what is being done. They're being bailed in. Of the two banks, the smaller, Leike uh, has been made a bad bank in a good bank, bad bank scenario where uh, good assets are moved to the good bank, the insured depositors and a small amount of uninsured depositors of Leike were moved uh, in a comparable amount to the good assets moved to the good bank, the Bank of Cyprus, uh, and then Leaky put into liquidation. It's the bad bank, it's closed. After you, after you move the, the good assets and, and the liabilities that you're going to cover and honor are moved to the good bank, it's closed. The remaining depositors there will get whatever the liquidation of this bank produces, which could be nothing, it could be uh, a, a, a fair amount. But that's the bad bank part of the scenario. The good bank, Bank of Cyprus, um, will continue operating after a significant haircut to, it had very few bondholders, on, not very, it's not a very typical bank, so the, they're wiped out, uh, but there was a significant haircut to the uninsured depositors, estimated at maybe 60 percent, uh, 
And to, in part to cover the uncertainty of these valuations, these, uh, uh, instead of just a straight haircut for the whole amount, they, they are getting, and I'm not quite sure whether it's for the full amount or to, for uh, part of the amount, they, they, they are getting equity for, for their claim. In, in, instead of the deposit, which the bank is obligated to pay out whenever they want to draw it, they're converted into equity. The equity may turn out to have some value or it may turn out to have no value. That depends on how accurate the assessment of the value of, of this bank's assets were. And only time will tell over the, the next few years. Some good loans may go bad. Some dodgy loans may, may, may recover. So th th this is the approach that has been taken. One final word is that because for such a large bank that is continuing in operation uh, and because of the time that it is taking, it's been almost a month now, of valuing the, the balance sheet and, and making all of these adjustments, it is a difficult, daunting task. For a period of time, controls have been put on how much money these depositors may withdraw. Their, their withdrawals are quite limited. Uh, and hopefully, at the end of the valuation process, when they draw the line and say, okay, this is, this is what we assess the assets at, this is uh, definitively the haircut that's going to be applied, uh, then those controls can be fully lifted and, and the bank that remains should be fu fully capitalized they might also consider guaranteeing the, the deposits that remain after they have completed that valuation process. Well, my assessment is that this is a dramatic improvement over Europe's tradition of bailing in. I highly, I, I'm sorry, the Europe's tradition of bailing out. This is, this is bailing in. Uh, I highly recommend an article in this morning's FT on this subject, urging Europe's zombie, undercapitalized zombie banks or potentially zombie banks to be honest, clean up the assessments of their balance sheet and where capital is inadequate to recapitalize and if they are not able to do so in the market to apply the Greek approach. This, this would be a revolutionary change in banking in Europe basically applying the American model to, to Europe, uh, and I find it very, very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warren. Uh, for those of you who are dismayed about the clock running, I control the next panel, so I'm going to uh, steal it forward if necessary to run into the next panel for I apologize. Um, Gonzalo is going to finish this session by drawing this together and doing a lessons learnt. I thought I'd uh, look at a little bit about what Cayman is like as an example of another offshore financial center and who's stolen the That's the previous one we need. Yeah, this, we need the previous one, which head is Cayman, Cyprus could not happen here, question mark. Right, thank you very much. Um, if everybody in the audience is there, approach the seven minute attention span is uh, wearing glasses. I hope you can read them, which is one of the complaints I have about some slides. It's impossible to read them from the front or the back. Brief survey of Cayman. Uh, and uh, interesting, Fitch recently, some of you may have noticed, put out a brief report saying that the banking industry in Luxembourg, Malta, and guess where, Andorra, were nothing like Cyprus and people didn't have to worry about it. I scratched my head and asked a banker why 
Fitch had decided on those three jurisdictions, hadn't mentioned Bahamas or Cayman or Hong Kong or anything. And he said that's because those three countries, Luxembourg, Malta and Andorra probably paid Fitch to put out that report. So I suppose that's a reasonable explanation. Cayman GDP, we think, is 3.1 billion. Uh, some of these figures are very rough and ready because statistical reporting in Cayman is still rather uh, patchy, mainly because the private sector doesn't like filling in the forms. Uh, the offshore banking industry most recently had about 1.4 trillion in assets and liabilities booked to 220 banks. Those of you with a calculator can easily work out that uh, a GDP relationship to the banking industry on the face of it is way out of whack. But of course we all know what's actually going on. Offshore B license, these are the people who can't do local business, make up the bulk of that uh, 1.4 trillion and of which a breakdown 1.36 trillion is booked to branches which as you know are not separate legal entities for, for lawyers, they may be for bankers. And 39 billion only is booked through separately incorporated subsidiaries or entities in Cayman. As I mentioned, offshore banks are prohibited from engaging in local lending in Cayman, except to a very limited extent. That means they can't lend for local construction projects, um, home mortgages, car loans, etc. The Cayman domestic banking industry is a little bit difficult to get a handle on it because the lines between the offshore and the domestic are not always clear because some banks actually participate in both. But if we reduce it to the core, there are seven full retail banks holding A licenses in Cayman. There are a number of other A licensed banks, but they don't really participate in the local banking industry. Um, the assets and liabilities of those seven retail banks is in the region of 12 billion. Those figures are slightly out of date. Uh, they've made uh, about 3.6 billion in local loans and they have about 6.1 billion, although that number has gone up, I, I gather, a little bit in local deposits. Um, since uh, 2008, particularly, the Monetary Authority in Cayman has required very regular reporting from the domestic banks, particularly to ensure that they're not overextending themselves and that they're not going to run into the sort of problems that we've seen elsewhere. And uh, suffice it to say, that's worked fairly well. As far as I'm aware, uh, when the financial crisis of 2008 hit, um, no Cayman banks um, actually ran into difficulties. One bank that operates in Cayman as a retail bank was recapitalized by its parent, but the parent was not in Cayman, it was in, in Bermuda. And, uh, that's well known that the Bank of Butterfield was recapitalized uh, and effectively has become a subsidiary of Carlisle and CIBC. But that was a recapitalization uh, solution to the problem, and the problem was not actually in Cayman, although it affected the Cayman operation somewhat. Uh, the next slide. We're very Darwinian. There is no local or offshore deposit or current account insurance in Cayman. You have your money in a Cayman bank, nobody is insuring it or agreeing to, to pay you out if the worst happens. And looking at what might happen very quickly, the Cayman government's annual budget is 780 million. Uh, my computer went completely wrong, so I hope the media isn't going to report this figure of public sector debt is not 8.6 billion, it's 860 million, 860 million. So, that my slide needs to get scrubbed. Cayman's maintained its AA3 bond rating, which was recently reconfirmed in January this year. Cayman is unlike the US, and unlike the UK, Switzerland, uh, it cannot print money like the Greeks, it can't print money like Cyprus, it can't print money. Cayman has a currency board structure to uh, the Cayman dollar and the US dollar and that means there is no printing press. In order for a bank to obtain Cayman dollars, it has to buy them from the monetary authority and has to pay for them in US dollars and the Cayman currency, of which is only about 100 million, is backed more than 100% by US treasuries. Now, we'll, we can discuss that on another day, whether that's the best thing to back it with. There are some corporate uh, AAA rated bonds as well. Uh, in addition, at the moment, due to uh, fiscal austerity, um, a la United Kingdom, we have the same thing in Cayman on steroids actually. I think Cayman is probably a test case for the United Kingdom to prove that it can work. Uh, 
and at the moment the Cayman government is not permitted to borrow without the consent of the United Kingdom and at the moment the United Kingdom has said that the Cayman Islands government cannot borrow any more money. So that makes it very unlikely that if a bank were to run into trouble now that the Cayman government is going to be in a position to bail it out even if it was so minded. In 2008 there was a uh, minor uh, indirect bailout of a local bank in Cayman which was a combination bank insurance company uh, a style of, of banking and insurance has now gone out of fashion again fortunately but the subsidiary of one of the local banks in Cayman did run into trouble and the reason was Hurricane Ivan I mean it was a very dramatic event that resulted in the Cayman General which is a subsidiary of Cayman National Corporation that also owns Cayman National Bank uh, and this is all public knowledge, this is not information that I have through my role as the chairman of SEMA. Uh, Cayman General had a very significant uh, coverage issue to guess whom, the Cayman government. And I think the Cayman government was probably the biggest claimant uh, as a result of Hurricane Ivan against Cayman General. And due to uh, the severity of the event and the structuring of Cayman General's insurance and reinsurance programs, uh, it frankly did not have the money to pay that claim. So what happened is there was a haircut and guess who took the haircut? It was the Cayman government reduced the level of its claims in order to sustain Cayman General and ended up as a minority shareholder of the insurance company. Time has moved on and that's being resolved. But that was an example of where in fact the Cayman government did have to take a, a haircut in order to assist an insurance company. Um, given the current government in the United Kingdom, I think we can safely say the likelihood of the UK government bailing out uh, any uh, Cayman Islands banks is remote. Uh, however, indirectly, because if you kick back to the uh, 1.5 trillion of offshore bookings that go through Cayman banks, uh, most of those obviously are major banks from other places in the world, and so there may well be an indirect bailout factor because the countries, home-based countries will in many circumstances bail out the parent or the ultimate holding company as part of a bailout for their own banks and we some of the UK banks that were bailed out uh, post the financial crisis had operations in Cayman so those operations in Cayman were not a problem per se but the parent group was effectively bailed out so you can argue there was a bailout of Cayman operations indirectly by virtue of the UK bailing out the parent and the same can be said for the US and Switzerland and other jurisdictions because if you look at the 1.4 trillion now this is information that I did get from abusing my position as former chairman of SEMA um, that, but I, was, I have been authorized to disclose it of the 1.4 trillion in assets and liabilities booked through Cayman, 55% of that, more than half, is represented by 12 banks. And three of those banks are US, two of them are Swiss, two of them are Brazilian, one of them's Canadian, two of them are Dutch, one of them's German, and guess what? Two are French, coming from the nation that hates tax havens. So, and of that 55% uh, approximately represented by those 12 banks, also one half, more than one half of the 1.4 trillion bookings are represented by interbank bookings and most of the rest are corporate banking relationships um, with major multinationals maintaining their funds offshore. The amount of individual business in that 1.4 trillion is tiny, whatever Tax Justice Network may tell you. I don't have the exact figures, but we, we, we do know that it's very small. So US and others may indirectly bail out their, their Cayman banking operations. Mostly remember these are branches, not subsidiaries. And I know for some bank regulatory purposes, branches are treated as separate entities. When it comes to uh, who's responsible, and this is a point that uh, Fitch has made, and I think the FT has made, that when it comes to responsibility, if we take a major US bank, um, and I won't, I won't name and shame them because you know who they are, the major US banks that were bailed out by Mr. Bernanke et al, uh, all of them had significant operations, booking operations through Cayman. Uh, and nobody said that, gosh, gosh, that's terrible, 
uh, the Cayman branch is insolvent, when it probably wasn't, but the bailout was of the total entity, so it did include indirectly the Cayman operations. If you are locally incorporated with no upstream parent, and um, in Cayman there are one, two, there are two or three of the full retail banks possibly fall into this category. They're locally incorporated, but they don't have a home-based parent where a bailout is likely. And those are the banks that would be of greatest concern. And I think the current position in Cayman is simply this. The Cayman government does not have the money to bail out uh, any of the retail banks in Cayman. The Monetary Authority is not a central bank and doesn't print money, so it isn't in a position to bail out. It can help restructure, as has happened in the past. And as has happened traditionally in the past, where there have been failures of small local banks, and it has happened over the years in Cayman, just like everywhere else, some fairly small players were, became insolvent and they were wound up. The only change that was made in Cayman was to give a very small preference in the liquidation of a Cayman bank to local depositors. If you have a deposit uh, of up to 20,000 Cayman dollars, just 25,000 US dollars, you have a, have a preference together with the uh, Cayman government and the employees in, the, in your claim. But that's the extent to which uh, depositors and account holders get any preference. So essentially Cayman meets um, the Warren Coate standard, which is that the regulators and the government are not going to bail out the banks and that it will remain as a, a true bail-in by the shareholders and the creditors. So that's where we are in Cayman and I'll now invite Gonzalo to come and wind this all together and tell us what lessons we can learn from it. Thank you very much. Well, it looks like I've been left with uh, an impossible mission, not because I need to figure out, uh, not only because I need to figure out lessons, but I mean, I believe Richard's uh, estimate of your span of attention, so by now I'm sure you're all doing something else. Anyway, I'm going to try to um, draw seven thoughts, and they call lessons because that's the title, but I think it's a little bit ambitious to call them that. Um, all the crises start initially uh, seeing as a liquidity crisis, uh, an increase in, in, in the demand from depositors to withdraw funds that banks can cope with. Uh, one of the first reactions that we've seen in this crisis over and over again is to limit the amount of withdrawals. Uh, I personally lived through that twice in Argentina. Uh, and what I can tell you is that by itself never works. The moment you put a restriction, the only thing you do is make people more nervous and get people to more desperately go and withdraw the funds. Um, and it sounds like an easy thing to do, but believe me, it's quite difficult. Uh, I saw people overnight opening 20 bank accounts in different banks and withdrawing money every single day. So it's not easy uh, to put a restriction, even this day and age and today's technology. Um, so basically, crisis uh, always occurs because there is a mismatch between um, the asset side and the liability side. Um, so it's very important to look at both for a second, where the money comes from uh, in the banks, and Warren touched on this, and where the money goes. Um, where the money comes, uh, I think that one thing that sometimes regulators overlook, uh, and I think banks are starting to get better at, at that, is that all deposits are not the same. And that's what I would propose uh, lesson number two. By all deposits are not the same, what I mean is what is, what is the source of the funds in terms of the type of investor? Uh, and we've seen the case of uh, the Icelandic banks, uh, where a lot of the uh, depositors or buyers of short-term debt were institutions. What happens when you have institutional investors is that uh, the fear grows through them very quickly, much more quickly than if the source of funds is retail, uh, and the withdrawal accelerates much, much quicker. So it's good to look at uh, overall liquidity, but it's important to look at uh, what is the source of, of, of those funds. Um, now, depositors don't 
wake up one morning and say, let's all go together and withdraw the funds. Uh, and I agree with uh, the, the previous speakers that at least in 99% of the cases, uh, the, behind the liquidity issue, there is a real or perceived credit issue. In every single crisis, uh, there is something behind uh, a piece of news that gets the, deposits nervous about the, the depositors nervous about the security of their funds and get them to start withdrawing funds. Uh, in the case of Cyprus, it was grid debt. In the case of uh, Argentina and others have been their own government debt. Uh, in the case of Northern Rock mortgages, uh, housing prices. In the case of the U.S., package mortgages and housing prices. Um, so, if the problem is a particular bank, uh, resolution can be uh, on a micro basis, uh, and that fund, uh, that bank, be be resolved. Um, and most of the losses will be absorbed by uh, the shareholder. When the problem is more generalized. Um, the resolution tends to be macro and affect uh, the whole economy. So at this point, and because it's Cyprus, I think it's worth uh, talking a little bit about uh, currency systems uh, and, and what role they play. If the country has uh, a free-floating currency and the central bank is not limited strictly in their mandate, one typical solution is printing money, uh, as Warren said. Um, the U.S. can do that, of course. Uh, Cyprus could not do that. Uh, Cayman would not be able to do that. So aggressively printing money uh, and putting liquidity in the institutions under stress uh, effectively um, ends up sooner or later in inflation, which to a certain extent is a kind of tax that is paid by the people, but also can uh, push to devaluation and people trying to uh, get their funds in a different currency and depends on how the country's structure can be a contagion mechanism. Um, so my, th my third lesson is the currency model in itself rarely is a driver of the crisis uh, but can definitely be a contagion mechanism and it's important to consider when looking at what is the uh, resolution that is going to be uh, implemented. So if the problem more often than not is uh, an underlying credit situation, uh, how is that we keep having these problems uh, over and over again uh, and that all the regulations that keeps growing and growing uh, cannot prevent these issues? Uh, in my opinion, the, the, the problem is simple. Markets evolve faster than regulation, and that will never change. That's not because regulators are incapable, of course, but simply markets are much bigger, much more resourced, and with economic incentives to create new structures. So although the problem is always credit, it shows itself in different ways. Um, in fact, regulation can sometimes even promote those problems. Uh, if we go back to Cyprus and, and Greek debt, the issue was that Greek debt had the same risk weighting than any other, uh, any other sovereign debt in Europe. So from the perspective of the simple banker that is looking at use of capital and re return on capital and risk weighted assets, Greek debt for a, for a while looked pretty attractive. So lesson number four is regulators should do their best to look at the aggregate position of the system and as soon as they start seeing a concentration, they should think hard if the current regulation is not creating false incentives that are getting the banks to invest in the wrong assets or to do the wrong thing instead of looking backwards. Um, so, after describing these issues and, and proposing to look at it on a, on a mismatch basis between the asset side and the liabilities, where the money comes from, where the money goes, uh, 
it is clear that offshore centers are in a particular situation, are different than other countries. And that's because uh, we, you have, if you're an offshore, uh, an offshore financial center, you have deposits coming from many countries around the world, and probably your investments are going to different places. So if your investments are not going only to very high uh, rated and safe investments and liquid investments, it's very important to look at if there is a mismatch between where the funds are coming in terms of jurisdiction and where they're going, because otherwise the system might be exposed to political risks, like capital controls. So it's crucial to understand uh, where those funds and, and where those uh, go. Um, but the other thing that is important to understand is if the system is uh, compartment, sorry, I always have a problem with this word, uh, is, is segmented in, in, in different buckets and whether or not there is flow between those, those buckets. And I'll put an example. Uh, Tim spoke briefly about Cayman, and I'm living in Cayman, so I, I, I speak about that example. We have a big segment of banks from Brazil and a big segment from the U.S. The funds that, the, that those branches in Cayman collect come from the U.S., the U.S. banks, and go back to the U.S., and the Brazilian banks come from Brazil and go back to Brazil. Because there is no deposit insurance, there is no contagion mechanism between those two segments. If something happens in Brazil and you have capital controls or anything that affects the Brazilian banks, there's no reason why that would affect the decision of the people that are depositing money in the U.S. branches, in the, sorry, in the Cayman branches of the U.S. banks. So the last lesson uh, or thought that I have is if you are an offshore financial center, be very careful about implementing uh, solutions uh, and regulations that are designed by, bank, by countries that do not operate as offshore financial centers. Because your system operates differently and you may be creating a problem rather than a solution. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we just about uh, made the time. I'd like to thank um, Richard Rahn, Warren Coates, and Gonzalo for that very quick analysis of Cyprus and lessons that we can all learn. And uh, if you want to take a 30-second break, and then I'm afraid you have to come back, some of you, and uh, listen to me 